What would you have seen if you would have been able to walk through cities of the late Roman Empire in 300 to 400 AD? How would the cities have changed throughout that fascinating time period? Would you already have seen a lot of desolation and decay? Imagine you have a time machine and you could travel back in time to explore this fascinating era of the late Roman Empire. The last century basically where everything was still okay-ish before the great invasions of the 5th century would start in the early 400s AD. Wouldn't it be fascinating to see different cities of the Western and Eastern Empire and see them change in the course of the last century in which the Roman Empire still existed in its entirety in both East and West? Let us then try to imagine how that must have been to walk through some of the most famous cities of the late Roman Empire from 300 to 400 AD. The twilight years of the Western Roman Empire. The last years relatively free of Germanic invasions and constant barbarian raids. The last, I don't want to say peaceful years because we know that there were always constant civil wars. But relatively speaking, compared to what would come after 401 AD, when Alaric and his Visigoths already started invading the Western Empire, laying waste to the province of Raetia, and in those years still being kept in check and defeated by the mighty Flavius Stilico, the defender of Rome. Relatively speaking, those were still good years from 300 to 400 AD. Yes, there were some occasional incursions of Germanics into Gallia from time to time, but on average, these didn't happen so often and were still driven back by the still powerful Western Roman forces under emperors such as the famous Julian himself or Valentinian I. In those days, the Germanic people still had no chance of breaking through the Rhine border for long periods of time. In other parts of the empire, the situation was not so good. In those times, paradoxically, the Eastern Empire was worse off than the West. The Balkans had been ravaged by the Goths who, after the disastrous Battle of Adrianople in 378 AD, had managed to permanently establish themselves in eastern Illyricum and thus to repeatedly put pressure on the Balkans. Those were very bad times for the Balkans in the Eastern Roman Empire and that would also be reflected in the state of its cities and people. Maybe if the Romans who lived in the Balkans back then would have had computers, they would have been better able to defend themselves, but of course for that they would have needed to know programming. I know, right? Genius transition. But bear with me here, because this might interest you even as a fan of Roman history. Why? Pretty simple. Because there is a way to learn programming the easy and fun way, and that might earn you some denarii or even some solidi. According to Stack Overflow, the median salary for back-end developers in the US in 2023 was over $100,000 per year. Median. And as a programmer, you can normally work remotely from home, so that means you can watch videos about the late Roman Empire on the side. And who wouldn't like that? So the people at boot.dev believe that the smartest way to learn programming is to make sure you're never bored. You will earn experience points like in an RPG game, unlock achievements and complete quests, and you can even ascend the ranks of a global leaderboard. Basically like a real-life game. But the reward being that you can earn serious money with your newly learned skills. Even old Rikima wouldn't say no to that. Mm -hmm. The platform is designed to get you writing a lot of code because getting your hands on the keyboard and shipping projects is the only way to really learn programming. You will learn back-end web development from start to finish in the Python and Go programming languages. Boot Dev is completely online, self-paced, and it really feels like a captivating RPG game complete with very motivating achievements every time you ascend a level. If you have any questions, the Boot.dev Discord community is very active and there to help if you ever get stuck on your coding challenges. I tried it out myself of course and I have to say it's surprisingly fun and easy to learn and that has to mean something coming from me as a total programming noob. So click the link in the description box and use my code MAYORIANOS to get 25% off your first payment for boot.dev. That's 25% off your first month or first year, depending on the subscription you choose. So learn programming with boot.dev and put your newly learned skills to good use. 
So back to the Roman Empire in 300 AD. In the east, of course, there were the constant wars with Persia, but from 299 to 330 AD, there was relative peace. And in the south, in the African provinces, there was very little pressure from desert tribes, nothing noteworthy. High up north in Britannia, the island was still defended by the mighty Magnus Maximus and others like him. However, unfortunately, they had the tendency to rebel quite often. Because, I don't know, but for some reason, the legions didn't quite enjoy staying on a far away island with bad weather and hostile tribes for long periods of time. So the situation was not ideal, but compared to what would follow after 407 AD, when the Rhine frontier was breached for good, this was almost paradise. So let us now imagine you start your journey in the year 300 AD, the age of the Tetrarchy. The empire has been split into four parts by the famous Emperor Diocletian. Let's say you walk through Alexandria in 300 AD. What would you have seen? Well, you would have been surprised to see that the population density was a lot lower now than only 100 years before. The Cyprian plague had ravaged not so long ago, only one generation before, and so the population still had not recovered. But the city itself would appear still very magnificent, of course. However, the Great Library and the Museion were probably either not existent anymore or in a badly damaged state. The heavy fighting of the Roman Civil War had left its marks. In 272 AD, Aurelian himself had taken the city under heavy fighting from the split away empire of Zenobia and in 297 AD, the Emperor Diocletian took the city again by force from a rival emperor. So even in 300 AD, you would have already seen quite some damage in parts. And so some of the old and famous buildings, which dated back to the 3rd century BC, were either badly damaged and not repaired or completely destroyed. That was certainly true for the Great Library itself and for the Museion, but other buildings certainly had survived unspoiled, such as possibly the tomb of Alexander and the famous lighthouse of Pharos. And you would have already seen the first churches here and there. Very few still, but already visible. In 300 AD, the emperors Galerius and Diocletian instigated the last widespread anti-Christian persecutions. How severe they were is still a matter of debate. Some scholars say that they were very regional and not widespread at all, while some say that thousands of Christians were still indeed killed. We do know that some churches were destroyed in the process and some Christians certainly were killed, but the true extent we can only guess at. So you might have seen the last times ever that maybe a church here or there was destroyed and possibly some Christian martyrs being executed. If you would have been in Antioch, you would have certainly seen more churches, even in 300 AD. This city was the epicenter of Christianization and had a strong Christian community even well before the Toleration Edict of Constantine, which would later follow in 313 AD. Here at Antioch, you could already see some quite impressive early Christian basilicas. Antioch was a role model, by the way, of how a peaceful living together between Christians and pagans could look. Rarely were there ever clashes between the two groups and they actually managed to respect each other and be tolerant of the respective faiths. You would in those days of course still see all the pagan temples open and still in good condition. In those times, there was no Constantinople yet. You would in 300 AD find the city of Byzantium with its old agora and the old temples on the Capitolium still absolutely intact. The city would still have appeared very pagan in those times. In Athens, you would have also seen the old monuments intact. Sure, they had been damaged in the Heruli sack of 267 AD, but most of the damages would probably have been repaired. However, you would still probably have noticed some damaged buildings or temples, or some abandoned houses. Moving westward, if you would have stopped at Salona, you would have marveled at the construction of Diocletian's retirement palace, which would later become the heart of modern day Split. The palace was finished by 305 AD and is a very well preserved wonder of the ancient world. 
Moving westward, if you would have passed through Italy in 300 AD, everything still appeared normal. Some cities had been damaged in the crisis of the 3rd century here as well, but not on a grand scale yet and if, the damage would have been mostly repaired by now, in the old heartland of the empire. Ravenna was not yet an imperial residence, but very important because one of the two Praetorian fleets was anchored there at the port of Classis. The other Praetorian fleet you would have found at Miseno, near the city of Neapolis. These were the last years when the West had still an impressive naval power before Constantine would use the fleets for his war against Licinius, thus later leaving Italy defenseless without a naval power. You would have found Mediolanum, an extremely impressive city. In those times, Mediolanum, modern-day Milan, was the imperial residence of the Western Roman emperors. Maximian had made Mediolanum imperial seat in 284 AD and since then the great imperial palace had served as seat of the tetrarchs. You would see the great circus, which was masterfully integrated into the city walls, you would see many ancient temples, amphitheaters and even gladiatorial games since they were still held in those times. So you would continue further to Rome, the old capital of the empire, by now over a thousand years old. It had almost reached its zenith by now in both population and extent and grandeur of buildings. Maxentius himself would build the last grandiose imperial buildings at Rome, but in 300 AD Rome was still not quite completed. The Basilica of Maxentius, the Temple of Romulus and some other buildings were still missing, which Maxentius would later add. But even so, Rome was still by far, in 300 AD, the most impressive city of the Roman Empire. One million people lived there and there was an incredible amount of commotion on the streets wherever one would go. If you would have traveled further west, you would have arrived at Augusta Treverorum, the capital of the westernmost part of the empire, seat of another one of the four tetrarchs. The city was very impressive in those times, if of course never as large and impressive as for instance Antioch or Alexandria. You would have found an imperial palace here, baths, city walls, even an amphitheater and many old pagan temples. Here you would have rarely seen any churches in those times because the west was by far not as Christianized as the east. But in Gallia you would have seen abandoned cities and even some of the still inhabited cities such as Lutetia were partially abandoned and dilapidated. There were quarters that had been evacuated and given up in the Germanic incursions of the crisis of the 3rd century. So especially in Gallia already, you would have seen the first signs of decay. The old amphitheaters were dismantled and often used to build defensive walls, since they were now much more important here than games. The threat of Germanic invasions was ever looming above the Gallic part of the Roman Empire, but still kept in check by the still very powerful Roman armies. And so in 300 AD, mostly everything was still quite okay in the Roman Empire. But how about 400 AD? What would have changed if you would visit the same cities a hundred years later? And please consider supporting this channel via Patreon or YouTube membership because I really need your help in order to be able to continue this work on late Roman history. Without your support, I don't know how much longer I can continue this channel because, as you can imagine, the YouTube algorithm does not exactly push a niche topic such as late Roman history. Thank you very much. Starting at Alexandria, you would see the streets filled again with many more people and there would be much more activity. However, more of the ancient buildings would be no more. Only a few years before, the ancient Serapion of Alexandria had been destroyed in possibly religious clashes between Christians and pagans and so another one of the old wonders was now but a ruin. But still, even so, the city was, was even then very impressive and extremely large with again possibly 500,000 people living in the old city of Alexander. You would now see many more churches of course and you would notice that the old pagan temples were now closed in most parts and not as frequented anymore. The same picture at Antioch. You would see many more churches than in 300 AD, 
of the early Christian basilica type, and the old pagan temples, you would find many of them closed and barred, as if someone had ordered them closed by imperial decree. But some apparently were still open, yet the activity there was a lot lower than a hundred years before. In 400 AD, you would find the city of Byzantium utterly transformed. It had grown tremendously in size beyond anything that you could have imagined. It was now probably twice the size that it had been in 300 AD. There were new baths, there were new city walls, the hippodrome had been enlarged, there was a new imperial palace complex and many churches which had not existed a hundred years prior. The city was utterly amazing, like a rising star, a new jewel of the east. But the old temples on the Agora, you would find them closed. They were used as storage spaces and not well maintained. You would find that old age started to show and soon indeed, not long after you visit, at some point in the 5th century, most of them would vanish, being reused for building material of new buildings. In the Balkans, you would find utter desolation. Some cities were completely abandoned, some burned down by the ravaging Goths. The people had evacuated to the larger, more fortified cities such as Constantinople or Athens further south. You would find many ghost towns in those days, with broken statues reminding you of old glory days which by now seemed like a distant memory. Walking further west, you would stop at Salona and find the palace of Diocletian in pristine condition. Almost a hundred years old by now, it would still appear unspoiled and the nearby city of Salona as well. No invasions had yet destroyed anything here. This would still be a long ways off, 200 years in fact, until the Slavs would start invading in the late 500s and early 600s. Going further west, in 400 AD, you would still find Mediolanum as the seat of the Western Empire. Here, the young Honorius would reside, protected by the defender of Rome, the Magister Militum Flavius Stilico. They would all reside at the imperial palace of Mediolanum. Only two years later, in 402 AD, would Honorius move the imperial seat to Ravenna. Mediolanum looked very similar to how it did in 300 AD, but as in the rest of the empire, you would find the same picture. Many of the old temples were closed, their interior often bereft of the old splendid statues, but instead, you would find many more Christian basilicas all around. And then you would go to Rome. And even in 400 AD, you would be utterly amazed. Rome was still the largest city of the empire in both west and east, even then still boasting 800,000 inhabitants, even then still outshining the as of yet smaller Constantinople. The city had reached its full size, the latest buildings of Maxentius all completed, the city still not having been sacked in 800 years, enjoying the last years of peace before the madness and chaos would soon descend onto the city. Here too, you would see many more basilicas and churches all around, but they would utterly go under in the sheer sea of old pagan temples and pagan imagery, statues and other impressive buildings of the old Caesars. Here, paganism would hold out, reluctant to die, stubborn in the old heart of the empire, and you could even here still see some temples frequented. But here too, many were already closed down and their interiors bereft of the splendid statues and images of the old gods. Traveling further west, you would go to Augusta Treverorum and find the city even more grandiose than in 300 AD. New, even larger baths had been added to the bath complex and the city walls had been enlarged. Here too, you would now find Christian basilicas, where before there had been none and the old temples were mostly closed and starting to fall into neglect. In Gallia, you would find more cities devastated and abandoned. Repeated incursions by Germanics in the 4th century had the people retreat to the larger, more fortified cities such as Lutetia or Mogontiacum. In Britannia, you would find even more chaos and desolation. 
Londinium was still a fortress in those times, with enlarged city walls built on orders of Julian himself against the repeated barbarian incursions. But you would already notice a severely diminished population and many of the old Roman buildings in disrepair, many of them even dismantled for building of the city walls. And other parts of Britannia had already been completely abandoned. Magnus Maximus had withdrawn a large part of the Roman troops in 383, and so areas such as Wales were left completely devoid of Roman troops, and many of the Roman towns and settlements were just given up, abandoned, empty, left to decay. And only a few years later would the last part of the Roman troops withdraw and the island was given up for good. And so we see that from 300 to 400 AD, you would have found a very mixed picture. Some cities were still in pristine condition, but some were, even already in 300 AD, badly damaged or partially abandoned, such as Lutetia or other cities in Gaul. And some were even in 400 AD utterly impressive, such as Antioch, Constantinople, Rome or Augusta Treverorum. It really depended very much on where you were. But we can see that even in the last good years, relatively speaking, of the Roman Empire as a whole, you would have very much wanted to avoid some places and cities, whereas other cities were utterly amazing and beautiful. Truly an empire and a time of contrasts. And please like and subscribe so that you won't miss any future videos on the fascinating era of the late Roman Empire. And please consider supporting my work on Patreon or via a YouTube membership because the long-term sustainability of this channel really depends on your support. And I would like to especially thank our new Augustus supporters, Quentin Walker and Justin Heller. Thank you so much Quentin Walker and Justin Heller for supporting Majorianus in such a generous way. But we also have three new Kaisar supporters as well, namely Johnny Cadigan McCarran, Hor Preber Tas Qualitas, I'm sorry, I'm certainly mispronouncing it, and Logan Peppers. Thank you so much, Johnny Kading McCarran, Hor Preber Tas Qualitas, and Logan Peppers for your generous support. Seriously, I cannot thank you enough. It is thanks to the amazing patrons and YouTube members of this channel that I can continue making videos about the late Roman Empire. I really want to thank each and everyone who is supporting this channel in any form. And if you want to learn more about the three most impressive cities of the late Roman Empire, you can watch this video in the upper right corner. But if you want to learn more about the city of Byzantium before it became Constantinople, you can watch the other video in the lower right corner. I say thanks again to all friends of Roman history, gratias Tibiago and Benevalete.